Friday afternoons, uh, the opening foray of our three-day McLean weekend. Thank you guys for uh, coming out through the kind of clam chowder-like atmosphere and uh, recognizing the change in uh, venue here. Uh, believe me, it's a lot nicer here than it is in Sealy Lake at the moment, so it was a smart thing to do, even though it may not look that way outside. I mentioned other sponsors uh, of this. Uh, Citizens Alliance Bank, Humanities Montana, Montana Cultural Trust, the Montana Department of Commerce, the National Endowment for the Arts, Betty Orr, Sealy Lake Community Foundation, and the Winston Rod Company out of Twin Bridges. And one of those people is in the audience right now. Hi, Betty, thank you. <laughs> Betty's the person hiding in a purple dress over there. <laughs> also was a, a, a roommate of ours during the Sealy Lake evacu evacuations. Uh, she has departed for her home since then. Okay, uh, the first person we're gonna have here today uh, is, uh, has a, a, a long and illustrious career, uh, a local legend, a regional legend, and a national legend. Uh, <coughs> He is the uh, citizen of the Blackfeet Nation. He is the Blackfoot troubadour. Uh, he has won a number of awards for his, his music, uh, his poetry, his readings, his writings. Uh, he, has the two, he has the Montana Governor's Humanities Award, the Art Council Innovation Award. Uh, he was featured on PBS. He's He's the Alumni Hall of Fame for the University of Washington. Even has a Rose Bowl ring on his finger if you really want to ogle. <laughs> uh, he's a recipient of the Charlie Russell Heritage Award. Uh, a long list of uh, awards recognizing his talent. Uh, I'd like to introduce you all to Jack Gladstone. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> Perhaps one of the uh, greatest uh, lessons I learned from Earl Old Person when he was emceeing powwows, when everything got uh, going, I want everybody to set your watch to uh, 1 o'clock right now, and we will be on time for the rest of the day <laughs> at that point. <laughs> but uh, uh, welcome. Uh, it is uh, with a great deal of, uh, uh, with a great deal of honor and uh, and a little bit of pride, you know, one of those uh, uh, steps that I uh, can address you a little bit. You know, the Blackfoot uh, River Valley uh, is historically, Stephanie Ambrose Tubbs will talk about the, uh, uh, you know, the Lewis, Lewis and Clark path on this. But this was a, uh, uh, what we call a road to the buffalo or a buffalo road for other tribes. So we had a special relationship with this uh, pathway, with this corridor. But um, something I would want to mention, right off the bat, I think I'm going to sing a song, and then I'm going to tell you the story of how important this was uh, for our people uh, on, a, on a mission over here in the late 1700s, and that mission was to helpfully uh, restore our Blackfeet uh, nation. Right off the bat, this song is called She's the Circle of Life, and this song is dedicated to the hydrological cycle and to all the cycles that are part of our lives. Uh, this is uh, for Mother Earth. I like to do this campfire style. In the center of a trillion stars, there's a circle from which we all have come. It reflects who we are. From the circle, we hear her seasons sing, enforcing harmony 
and from this song we know her love in all the earth receives but from the snow pack in the highlands her blood flows with the spring forever the song's a lover a songbird choir sings she's a circle of the light She's the loom of the sun's creation. She's his forever wife. She's a harvest of every nation. She's a mother of every life born through each day and each night. And with the Father she gave the earth for. She's a circle of life. In our paths of time, we share the sky with those upon the way, and with those living beneath the waves, whose motion is unseen. All life around stems from the green, in green all life abounds. We step her dance and speak her song, when he season sounds from the snow pack in the highlands her blood flows with the spring forever the songs a lover the gray wolves the gray wolf choir sing she's a circle of life she's the loom of the sun's creation She's a spore in the plant. She's a harvest of every nation. She's a mother of every life born through each day and each night. And with the Father she gave the earth for. She's a circle of life. Big voices say, she's a circle of life. Loom of the sun's creation. She's the loom of the sun's creation. Forever wife, she's a forever wife. Harvest of every nation. She's a harvest of every nation. Mother, she's a mother of every life. Day and night, through each day and each night. When Father she gave the earth floor, with the Father she gave the earth floor. She's a circle of the light. She's a circle of light. She's a circle of light. Matrilineal DNA analysis, there have been human beings in the New World in the, the Americas for at least 25,000 years. And the, uh, the scientific uh, thesis, uh, hypothesis uh, for this is called the Kelp Highway or the, uh, uh, the Paleo Marine Migration Theory, all sliding all the way down the West Coast and then diffusing inland at that point. Uh, that was uh, presumed to be first one. Of course, our, our indigenous peoples here have another understanding, and that understanding is since every cell, every cell within our bodies was composed of the elements of this landscape, this is where consciousness was born, and this is where we came from. But I think it's nice to acknowledge both sides because we are... Uh, we're an equal opportunity uh, education, uh, educator. At least with, within my programs, that's what I do. Ruth Ann Knudsen. Ruth Ann Knudsen is an anthropology professor. She's in her, she's in her mid 70s just going strong at the a college, University of Great Falls. And we were talking about this, and I said, "What's the take on it?" And she was talking about 14 and 15 thousand years uh, of uh, old archaeological sites. Our Blackfeet have an archaeological site that is uh, over 13,000 years. And this, where did we come from? 
the question arises, and she told me, you know, there were there was glacial Lake Missoula, and there were catastrophic, cataclysmic events with the floods and with these water letting go. Uh, you know, within a 48-hour period of time, uh, all the, the flow of all the rivers in the world <coughs> times 10, reaching speeds up to 100 miles an hour from right here in western Montana, the Panhandle, what is now Idaho, through the central Washington area. This is presumed, why I mentioned this, this is presumed to be one of the first, if not the first way people were able to penetrate into this area of what we call western and ultimately central uh, Montana. And our Blackfeet ancestors and our stories recognize that we were here with the consciousness of the ice that was also with us. There are stories there. There was, uh, of course, a speed, well, fast forward a few uh, thousand years. Christopher Columbus discovered himself in the Americas in 1492. And with this uh, discovery, there was the unleashed what we call the Columbian Exchange. From both directions, there were plants and animals and uh, ideological, philosophical, institutions, technolo technologies, but perhaps the most important or the most um, uh, tragic circumstance that happens is called the demographic catastrophe, where our numbers, our sheer population numbers plummeted because of the biological, bacterial, and viral diseases that were we were like rooms full of gasoline fumes, our different tribal uh, uh, divisions and our uh, indigenous nations. When these sparks of things like smallpox, diphtheria, mumps uh, hit our populations, there were depopulation ratios that went over 90% in a lot of cases. The uh, situation with our black people, uh, now, there's a book, Elizabeth Fenn, in the, uh, her a book, Pox Americana, she's a Duke University history professor, Pox Americana, recognizes the smallpox epidemics that started in 1774 on the East Coast, and this almost like this slow burning, moving epidemic all the way across the continent, burning itself out finally early in the 1790s on the northwest coast of Washington. For our black feet, this was 1780, 1781. Up until that point, we had a, a degree of integrity with the coming of the horse, but we did not allow the Hudson's Bay Company in at that point. We told them, of course, through sign language we communicated, why should we come trade? We have millions of buffalo along these mountains, the purest, sweetest, cleanest waters, grasslands, the beaver have supplied uh, the diversity and the strength and the power uh, with its power and with that bundle. Uh, why should we come? And uh, it was the smallpox epidemic of 1780-81. Elizabeth Fed wrote about this and traveled through Blackfeet country. And such was the shock to recover from something. You know, what does not kill you makes you stronger. And I re this was a story that I had heard from Daryl Kipp, now the late Daryl Kipp, the founder of our <coughs> language program and the immersion school in Browning. But there were, there were branches of our warriors that did go in many directions. And the, uh, the challenge was to find stock, to find stock, to find people to uh, interchange genes with. And in this case, there was some raiding for women and across these mountains into the Blackfoot and through the Blackfoot all the way to the Nez Perce, Daryl uh, says, and there were some with the, uh, with the Salish peoples and the Kootenai peoples. You're bringing in that new blood and you're diversifying this. While this may seem tragic and savage, this was a matter of life and death for our Blackfeet people. And this was one of the ways in the years afterwards, a few years afterwards, that we started to recover. The other one was in 1789, 1790, the overture from the Hudson's Bay Company was accepted. And those Hudson's Bay Company posts were uh, uh, set up uh, north on the North Saskatchewan River, Fort Edmonton, and Rocky Mountain House being the most 
uh, conspicuous there. So I, I do like to, to mention these river valleys were places of travel and diffusion. Traditionally, Blackfeet uh, people did not eat fish. This was a taboo. However, in the 1840s, there was one clan, there was one clan that uh, discovered or broke that taboo, kind of started thinking and acting and consuming out of the box. This was my clan, the fish eater clan. And northwest of Fort McLeod, Alberta, or what now stands Fort McLeod, Alberta, in the Porcupine Hills, there was a hard winter. I have that song, Bear Who Stole the Chinook. It was one of those winters where the snow piled up and there was no Chinook wind. And as the food ran low and the firewood ran low, something had to be done. And we knew that there were underwater people, what we call sweet people. Everyone say sweet people. The underwater beings were under there. And we suspected, long suspected, that they might be good eating, but that taboo. <laughs> why not think out of the box? Oh, we still had some buffalo left, so why don't we go turf and surf? <laughs> and we broke through the ice in that winter, and we, capped, uh, we caught uh, bull trout, and we, we consumed those bull trout. It was taboo, but something worked, because uh, we, uh, we had a, a number of great leaders. Pinaquim was one. Pinaquim was seen from afar. And in addition to thinking outside of the box, he traveled outside the box. All the way down to, it appears from his stories, the Gulf of Mexico, all the way over to California. And through these travels, and through his diplomatic, easygoing manner, and especially through American Indian Sign Language, he was able to communicate fluently and begin to understand that the wave of what we call the Napiquans, the tricksterman, the wave of Napiquans that was coming could not really be stopped. And ultimately, diplomacy was the path. And indeed, it was in 1855 that the Governor Stevens um, uh, delegation was going around all over the, the Hellgate Treaty over here was one of those parts. Uh, Chief Seattle, uh, Seattle from the uh, Pacific Northwest and the Duwamish of which Seattle was named after, where I was actually uh, educated out there. That was uh, one of those uh, treaty making uh, events where Stevens was all over the place. But Pinaquim, Pinaquim was uh, seen from afar, was one of the greatest leaders and what he said in that all of the divisions of the Blackfoot Confederacy would come to the Judith River or called the Lame Bowl Treaty by some because if we are all there and present, even the Grovon, even the Sarsi, uh, they were uh, within our Confederacy, should be represented because we did not put any line what is now the Canadian border between ourselves and the other tribes north in what we now think of in Canada. This was all Blackfoot Indian Confederacy. So with that travel and with that thinking outside the box, uh, we were able to uh, arrive at the Treaty of 1855. And it is on the basis of that treaty, on the basis of the Hellgate Treaty, on the basis of <clears throat> the other 369 treaties that were uh, negotiated and signed between the late 1700s and 1871, that our right to exist was, uh, uh, was structured because those treaties essentially are nation-to-nation -nation agreements and are mentioned in Article 6 of the United States Constitution as the supreme law of the land. And to our ancestors, <clears throat> all I have to say is good forethought, good forethought. I would like to close out my uh, uh, short uh, session here. You know, the thinking outside the box uh, was very important. And in the return back from the Pacific, I'll tell you a little story first. I might just run a couple minutes over time, but I'm going to tell you the story. My dad went from, Has from the Blackfeet Reservation to Haskell Indian School in Lawrence, Kansas. He was there when World War II broke out, and he 
continue the trend with the other indigenous peoples in the boarding schools on the reservations. The highest rate of volunteerism among any ethnic group in the United States in the last century have been American Indians for the United States military service. This was partially due to the obligation of the young man to serve territory and to serve community and to be responsible for the protection as such. I asked one of the, Nav I have a song, Navajo Co-Talkers, on an album I did uh, uh, 20 years ago, and it was uh, Albert Smith. I said, why did you serve? And he said, Jack, you have to remember that this was our homeland as indigenous peoples long, long time before it became the United States of America. In essence, we are protecting our community and our homeland. The United States signed on to a pretty good deal in that regards. That what wound up in the uh, North Pacific immediately, and after the Aleutian Islands and the Japanese made their fate around the time of the Midway, uh, the Battle of the Midway, we had a lot of troops up there. And my dad was a 20 millimeter gunner uh, on a troop ship. So here he's walking down below, and all of a sudden he looks across the room, uh, and there's Hillary Gillum and Jackie Loring, two guys he grew up with you know, on the reservation. And he said, so, holy smokes, these guys are all dirty and beat up, and they've been, uh, they've been fighting on the Aleutian Islands with the Japanese. And my dad said, wait, I'm, I'm almost off watch right now, and I'll come get you. And he went, took him above board, I guess it just, people were throwing up in the whole work, but he was able to, uh, to take his two buddies from the res up there and let them see the horizon, get them some soup and some tea and stabilize them. They never forgot that. When I would go back with dad uh, to the reservation and we would see those guys, uh, Hillary wound up uh, in uh, the FBI, office of the FBI, uh, back there in uh, Indian uh, police. And uh, Jackie Loring, his other buddy, wound up with his wife, Betty, in Lower St. Mary's Lake. In Lower St. Mary's Lake, he got the tribal fishing permit to net fish, primarily white fish, but whatever jumped in the nets or swam into the nets, they would bring and they would clean and they would sell to the local restaurants around that side of the park. When my dad sobered up in 1967, the first thing he did, he says, I'm gonna take you back where your people are from. And for me, who had heard nothing but stories up to that point in my nine years, stories and Charlie Russell calendars, okay, that was my impression of this land. We went back over to the going to the Sun Road, the night of the Grizzlies, the same year, 1967, and then down, and we went up to Jackie Loring's, and I smelled those sourdough hotcakes uh, uh, and the bacon, and there was whitefish and there was trout, and they laid out breakfast for us, and we ate. And I was able to spend a, a degree of time with Jackie Loring uh, when I moved back after my graduation, but it was in 1985 that Jackie Loring took sick in the Fort Harrison Hospital, and as a veteran, he had that, he had that right, that connection. And I went and got a card from everybody in the valley. Everybody knew Jackie Loring and loved Jackie and Betty. Their <coughs> card signed, it was his cowboy riding into the home. He was terminal cancer. And I <coughs> gave him this card, and he was conscious, but he could not speak. <coughs> and they ran me out of there about 11.30. I was singing him a few songs at the hospital. And the next morning at 5.30, I had to say goodbye and, and check out. I went in there, he was gone. What, I did have the wrong room? They said, no. We checked, at 3.30, the check, he was still alive. At 4.30, they checked, and he had passed. He had deceased, he had moved on. And I thought, in, uh, when I was writing this song, this, this came together before his funeral, but I would like to finish off with this. It's called Farmer of the Waters. And it was between that 3.30 check and that 4.30 check that Jackie Loring uh, uh, decided to get up and move on. And that's exactly the time he used to get up and uh, uh, get his fishing morning going with those nets. So this is called Farmer of the Waters. This is off the uh, back, tapping the earth's backbone. That's what we call, everybody go like this. Now say, Mistakinks. 
Akit means the backbone of the world. For these mountains were not called the Lewis Overthrust or the Rocky Mountains or even Glacier Park, but rather these mountains were called the backbone of the world. And from its crevasses, from its big snow banks and glaciers, is where the source of all life could grow from. Fisherman wakes at 4 a.m. without a clock alarm. He knows not to let the nets he set fall victim to his harm. The dawning air is chilly when the sun's below the rise. His yawning walk delivers him directly to Lake Side. And he crosses depths where his net set pulls him to his grass. He removes the aqua harvest. The lake is rippled glass. With slow but timeless certainty, the sun bursts or divine, granting strength and vision to the cats now dancing at his side. They sparkle bright like diamond gold on aqua blue terrain. He's a farmer of the water, his boat the plow pump made. And he rows in right on heavy with a harvest from the blue. His tubs are full and floppy with the food that's native true. I am proud to hold in memory a man's finest hue. You're a farmer of the water, true and true. Well, the morning sun soon as the sun is overhead and high. The fish are in old orders pen, now filled by you and wife. With sharp and swift precision, blades were used and fillets made. How often did I think that not for any life you drink? For as winter pulled your body down, the spring brought life anew. And time and time again you rose to cast your nets on blue. Yes, we are proud to hold in memory a man as fine as you. You're a farmer of the water, true and true. Now there are farmers of the waters plowing across the ocean plain whose fields will flood with topsoil with the rolling of the rains. From the sandy beach in Waikiki to the lakes of Tennessee, from the future to the past we know, the man from Galilee. And they row in right on heavy with a harvest from the blue. Their baskets full and flopping with the food that's native true. Yes, we are proud to hold in memory men as fine as you. Farmers of the water, true and true. Yes, I am proud to hold in memory men as fine as you. You're a farmer of the water, true and true. Well, the 
fisherman woke at 4 a.m. The sun was on the rise. Thank you, Jack. He started talking about the circle of life and about how in 1790 eating bull trout was a taboo. Well, this circle of life is still, a, if today, it's still a taboo. So, <clears throat> uh, I didn't mention earlier, I'm Jerry O'Connell. Uh, I'm the big Blackfoot river keeper uh, and uh, thus any event with a McLean history or story, I'm very interested in it. I, uh, uh, I love the Blackfoot and all its history, so this is, this is, this is very cool for me. <clears throat> our next uh, speaker is our, our main speaker of the day. Uh, I'm reading his, one of his books right now for the second time. I first read it, One Round River. Uh, probably 15 years ago, and uh, I'm rereading it now, uh, and it's fascinating because it was written in 1997, when the river, the Blackfoot, was in the throes of change, uh, in the early stages of, of what we call a miraculous recovery. And reading the book now, his 1997 perspective and what the river has become, is fascinating. Uh, perspective to get. I would suggest, uh, if you haven't read it, it's a good book and it really, if you're familiar with the river today, it gives you an idea of how far we've come. Uh, <clears throat> with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Richard Manning. Thanks, Jerry. It makes me nervous talking, have people talk about my books are 20 years old. It's kind of like seeing a photo of yourself in a leisure suit, <laughs> long sideburns and things like that. I hope it's not that bad. Actually, I'm thinking a little bit about passage of time today. Today is my anniversary. My wife's sitting here. <laughs> That's kind of a semi-weird story. Um, because if you look out that front door, you look directly in the window of the apartment we lived in the day we got married. <laughs> it's bizarre being back in this neighborhood. I actually have another semi-weird story to tell you before I get down to business. Um, Tracy and I took off and got out of the smoke for a week. We were over on the Olympic Peninsula last week. And while I was there, I thought, God damn it, that's coming up. I better write something down that I'm going to say. And so I started planning today's talk. And I did the usual thing, which is, you know, you're writing about Norman McLean, all you got to do is string together a bunch of quotes and put a few snide comments in, and you got your speech right there. <laughs> but then I thought, that's really dumb, because if you do that, you're going to put a bunch of Norman McLean sentences next to a bunch of your sentences, <laughs> and people are going to see right away. So I decided finally that I'm going to limit myself today to one scene, one scene only, because I think it's a really important scene. So I decided that and I roughed in a few notes and then we drove back home. And we drove from Aberdeen, Washington over uh, all day through smoke. We picked up smoke at Olympia, Washington and drove through heavy smoke all the way through and, and until we got to Wallace, Idaho. And I said, that's it, pulling over for the night. We're going to stop in Wallace. So we thought we'd have dinner. We went downtown and there's a cafe in Wallace and it's a small cafe, like everything in Wallace, it's dinky. And we went in the cafe with six tables on it and on the wall was a flat screen TV. Now, there are a number of things you can put on flat screen TV. My preference is nothing. <laughs> but you can put the internet on, you can put video games, you can put advertisement, but they were showing films. If you stop and think about it, and I haven't Googled this number, but there are at least three godzillion films on DVDs, right? Anybody want to guess what film was playing on that flat screen TV? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And in the nanosecond, I looked up from my menu to see, 
and recognize that film, what scene do you think was playing at that precise moment? Yeah, exactly, exactly. What are the odds against that? What scene? <laughs> the scene that I'm going to use in this talk. <laughs> From a river runs through it. Yeah, exactly so. Um, if, I, I'd be, if I were a superstitious person, I would believe in divine providence of some sort. But if there's a mathematician in the crowd, please tell me what the odds of that happening are. I'd love to know. I told you I'd get down to business. <clears throat> I grew up in Michigan but moved west as a young man because I wished to live among mountains. I brought with me a red Winnebago sized backpack made by a company called Jerry, a pair of waffle stomper hiking, hiking boots that weighed about 15 pounds each, <laughs> a plexiglass compass and a miniature aluminum tea kettle stamped on its top with what I assume is a brand name. It says Hope. H-O-P-E. I still have and I still use the tea kettle in the back country. I probably should replace it with one design better. But against all contrary evidence that has accumulated in the intervening years, a lifetime, I somehow cannot abandon the message stamped on its top. The three other items are gone. I no, no, no longer need them, although I'm in the back country now more than ever. I have lighter boots and a more compact backpack. But I discovered I can do without the compass altogether in the mountains. Although I needed it in my deep woods Michigan childhood home, the flatland where a guy could and did get seriously lost. The simple fact derives from a profound truth slowly revealed to the hyper observant pilgrim the serious student of wilderness ways. And it is this, and you may want to write this down. Water runs downhill. <laughs> Everything I have to say today derives from this sublime and elusive fact. Sorry about that. Should, I should spend money on better paper. You are not lost if you follow the water because it invariably leads to a stream and then to a river. And the river will tell you your place in the world. This is how everything merges into one. And the rivers run together and they run across all things, all places, all people's places, and all people's sins. Good newspaper reporters of my generation were told in straightforward terms to follow the money. But I have made my living following rivers. Rivers keep account of our sins. I got this idea from mountains and from Norman McLean. Early on, I didn't have enough faith in this notion to test it elsewhere, so I strayed not even a single solitary inch from my source of inspiration. I wrote a book about the big Blackfoot. Even now, I haven't strayed all that far. Here are my, are my last three magazine assignments in order. One. An editor asked me to do a story on industrial agriculture in Idaho, which you'd think would have something to do with potatoes. I went straight to the Snake River, and I read in great detail there, in its water, a story of abuse and corruption. Two, an editor sent me to Iowa to write something about the last set of presidential primaries for Harper's Magazine. During the very week I arrived there, a nut job a joke of a candidate, a billionaire showboat with orange hair, began to rise in the polls to the astonishment of the pundits. So I crowded into a high school gymnasium full of fat, federally subsidized corn farmers, victims of government overreach, every one of them. I crowded in to see one of Trump's rallies to catch his act, and it scared me witless, which it turns out is not scared enough. This is real bad, I said. So I need to make my way to the Des Moines River and therein read the story of subsidy and greed that sent those smug white farmers to cheer on an oligarch. Assignment three. An editor at Harper's sent me to Flint, Michigan to try to understand how poverty, racism, and government malfeasance poisoned an entire city to the size of Missoula, once twice the size of Missoula. And of course, I began looking at the Flint River. 
But it, there it was very different. There my death to McLean ran deeper still. I was born in Flint. My family history is intimately entwined in the poisoning of the Flint River. My intent was to ignore that fact and instead do my journalistic diligence that day by writing the general story, not my particular story. But as I sat in a motel room when I first arrived in Flint, there arose an irresistible urge to probe the private, to find the house where I had been a toddler, the creek that I had played in. My father's records as a city cop. My first reaction to this impulse was to fight it. After all, I was not being semi-handsomely paid by Harvard's to indulge my own story. I thought this, but then it occurred to me this private matter was the story. And this is literally true, that I gave myself permission to report my family's story when my thought train tripped on the name of Norman McLean. Isn't there a river running through Flint? So then it is altogether fitting and proper that we should gather here today to celebrate the work of Norman McLean in a conference. Hell yes, yeah, sign me up. I'm your man. I've been dining out on his work for an entire career. I'm a lifelong one-trick pony. And it's nice work if you can get it. The only real downside is being destined to repeated conversations, variations on the theme like this with editors, objecting to stories with trees in them. I usually hear it this way from an editor, a person born, bred, read, fed, schooled, employed, and otherwise solely inhabiting a single seven mile long island on the east coast of the continent, who thinks of me as a provincial writer. <laughs> <laughs> Says my editor in objection, I think it might be a bit facile and trite here where you've used this river as a metaphor po for political corruption. To which I can only forever answer, it's not a fucking metaphor, it's a river. <laughs> <laughs> but still nice work if you can get it. <laughs> and much as I've needed Norman McLean until now, I have a feeling we're all going to need him more in coming days. This has everything to do with the compass, that we as a people have lost our way. And we need to find it. We need the moral compass of rivers. When I was in Flint on that assignment, I heard a quirky two-word phrase that instantly rekindled a flood of recognition and memory, a common phrase in Michigan. It is this, up north. The people of Flint used it exactly as it had been used there when I was a kid, that to experience nature, one needed to go up north. Then and now, it is widely believed, with cause, that there is no nature in the industrial city of Flint, Michigan. The Flint River is really not a river, it's poison. It is a sewer. So on weekends, people go up north where nature is, where real rivers are, the Osabo, the Pier Marquette, the Fox River, which in literature became the Big Two-Hearted River. I mostly grew up not in Flint, but in a little town up north. And when I was a teenager, an unknown, starving poet, a young man not all that much older than I was, also from up north, a fellow stump jumper and a cedar savage, <clears throat> He lived a couple counties west of mine, and he came to read his poetry to a squirming audience of adolescents captive in my high school auditorium. I have no memory of what the poet read that day, but probably should have played closer to attention. No doubt he included an early version of a poem he would later, that later appeared in his collection titled The Theory and Practice of Rivers. Maybe it would have taught me something about what would become my life's work, as only poems can do. Jim Harrison later would title one of his most important books, a novel about family and exploitation of nature, True North. I know what he means. A compass to a Michigander is like rivers in mountains. It is how we find our way in the world, directions north.
It is a moral compass and it points north. This is exactly what Norman McLean means to tell us about rivers, and he does so in what is a pivotal passage toward the end of A River Runs Through It, when the father and two sons are fishing on the Blackfoot River near Belmont Creek. The passage is a conversation between Norman and his father at Streamside, where the preacher is reading his New Testament in Greek. Norman asks him what he is reading, and his father answers, in the part I was reading, it says the word was in the beginning, and that's right. I used to think water was first, but if you listen carefully, you will hear that the words are underneath the water. And Norman answers, that's because you are a preacher first and then a fisherman. If you ask Paul, he will tell you the words are formed out of the water. McLean, of course, lets us know what is at stake in this conversation, the very foundation of Judeo-Christian theology. Gospel of John, first chapter, first verse, that in the beginning the word was the Word, and the Word was God. How else could it be for a people of authority, autocracy, laws, and literacy, a contractual people? To a preacher, morality is the word on stone tablets and it has nothing to do with compasses and rivers. Both Norman and Paul know otherwise. And Paul, in this very scene, asserts the primacy of rivers over the word with a literal baptism, made all the more miraculous because he lands his fish and he keeps his cigarettes dry in the process. What is most clear, though, is that when Paul submerges in the river, he becomes the river. He becomes nature. He slips beyond Norman's and his father's comprehension, beyond their ken, clearly beyond their words. We know this because of a single word, and it is the word that settles the debate as to whether nature or the word is primary and foundational. Paul holds up his fish, and the father can only say, he is beautiful. He means the fish, maybe. It is usefully and tellingly ambiguous here. But the same word resurfaces later when Paul is dead. He was beautiful. Earlier, the same word appears in setting up the scene by the river. Beautiful? Beautiful? Come on. Is this all you've got? An empty, vague word that signifies nothing so much as the powerlessness of our words. A hollow placeholder of an adjective that announces we have come to the edge of our abilities as writers to describe, to name, to delineate the ineffable, to match the power of nature. Exactly so. That's the point. The words come from the river just as beauty comes from the river, but the power of our language and words will always fall short of the ineffable. Otherwise, we wouldn't need the word ineffable. <laughs> the word beautiful marks nothing so much as a writer's surrender in the face of a greater power, which is why it is so important here and everywhere. It marks the edge, but it also urges readers to peer beyond that edge, to perceive what might lie in that vast, mysterious space beyond this word and beyond all words. As writers, we say this with this word. Don't take my word for this. Come see this for yourself. Norman MacLean is not the first great writer to tell us our moral compass is set by rivers with a power that super supersedes the word. Oddly though, and maybe not so oddly, the tradition of doing so brings us straight up against that exact word of surrender that Norman MacLean used. Late in his life, the original in these matters, Henry, Henry David Thoreau, tackled the exact same issue in a single sentence. And now you're probably asking what business I have bringing Thoreau into this, he being a certified pond man, <laughs> an Easterner certainly, and as a result, suspect, because he lives some distance from Missoula, Montana. 
Likely as not, he was also a bait fisherman. <laughs> but it's all a bum rap. Book, went, book titles notwithstanding, Thoreau was in fact a river man. His time on Walden was short, but he lived his whole life surveying, combing, walking, canoeing rivers. And we don't need his a biography to tell us this. He told us himself in a single miraculous declarative sentence. Here it is. The perception of beauty is a moral test. There's that word again, beauty. The perception of beauty is a moral test. There is no more succinct statement of that uniquely American idea called transcendentalism. Thoreau believed it, he lived it, he knew that our moral instruction comes not from creed, not from theology or law, it comes directly from nature. He believed we gathered that instruction not in words, but by daily contact with nature, by walking, literally by walking. All of his stories had trees in them. He walked among them daily. For Thoreau, this whole idea came to a head in one long fit of fury that would consume most of the last decade of his short life. An eruption that exploded into public view in a speech he gave in his hometown of Concord, Massachusetts on July 4th, 1854. As was his habit, he came to his message that day by reporting on his walks in the woods. Here's what he said. I walk toward one of our ponds, he said, but what signifies the beauty of nature when men are base? And then he gave us a sentence some of us will find depressingly useful today. He said, the remembrance of my country spoils my walk. <laughs> he said this by which he meant his nation, his government, these United States. In his case, there was any doubt, he added this, my thoughts are murder to the state and involuntarily I go plotting against her. He meant this quite literally. And so too did the hundreds of stolid Yankees gathered at Concord that day to hear him speak. It being the 4th of July, there were American flags on display during that speech, but they were flown upside down and they were draped in black crepe. Someone there that day burned a copy of the U.S. Constitution, and Thoreau stood in its ashes when he read, when he spoke. These Yankees, Thoreau and his audience, were abolitionists. And they were gathered that day in protest of the recently passed Fugitive Slave Act. The law had sent federal marshals into Massachusetts, rounding up freed slaves living there, sending them south into slavery, and jailing any white people who resisted. Thoreau and his neighbors were actively and directively, directly engaged in the Underground Railroad. They were smuggling slaves to freedom in Canada beyond the reach of the Fugitive Slave Act. Thoreau made it abundantly and explicitly clear that his contact with nature his walking, his rivers instilled in him a moral imperative to resist, and he did, with more than speeches. He personally harbored escaped slaves in his house. He knew and he befriended John Brown. When John Brown was hanged for his attack on Harper's Ferry, and this really was the opening battle in the war against slavery, but our country judge it to be an act of sedition. Thoreau personally drove the wagon that smuggled one of Brown's co-conspirators out of the country. He had some skin in the game. If Thoreau had been caught doing this, he certainly would have been imprisoned. He probably would have been executed. We sit today more than a century and a half distant and a continent's worth of rivers away from this event, 
yet it seems so near and relevant. Recall now that only a few weeks ago, when white supremacists marched on Boston, thousands on thousands of good Americans, stolid Yankees, cast in the spirit of Henry David Thoreau, took to the streets and they silenced them. This only 25 miles distance from where Thoreau spoke in Concord on that day in 1854. Only 25 miles distant, but on the exact same issue. The American stain, the arrogance and racism that permits us to enslave, lynch, exclude, impoverish, and subjugate people who are not white. As we gather here today to celebrate rivers, this is not at all irrelevant. Thoreau tells us nature's moral compass points out a straight, clean line from rivers to abolition and resistance to a government gone wrong. So does Norman McLean. Many of us read A River Runs Through It as an imperative to defend the integrity of rivers, and by extension, defend all of wild nature. Certainly I do. But this message is derivative in McLean. He did not directly charge us to be environmentalist, but he did directly state a separate imperative that in the final analysis is not really separate. Do we have a duty to help one another? Can we even understand one another well enough to help when it is needed? The literal question, am I my brother's keeper? Like Thoreau, McLean shows us that rivers charge us, each one of us, with this very responsibility. These two duties, to the environment and to each other, to community and to place, are not really separate. Like rivers, they flow into one, and yet I cannot think of no greater measure of the peril of our times than to realize that these two issues alone, alone, profoundly frame the challenge before us right now. Today, both of these bedrock values are under siege. These are the two primary pillars of American integrity. And it is not an accident that these are the very two issues under full frontal assault by the right-wing cult that has commandeered our nation. But not here. Not today. Not in this room. I have a sense here that I could gain full support for this proposal I have. And here's my proposal, that we the people do establish and ordain a new standard for our democracy. Two new articles of confederation. First, that we have a duty to help each other. And second, that the integrity of our people is properly and best measured and sustained by the integrity of our rivers. These are the truths that we the people hold to be self-evident. I suspect this is an easy sell in this room because I know each of you. And I know that you are separate from most of our countrymen in this matter. I know that each of you has a working moral compass. I know this because your stories, each and every one of them, have trees in them. You have been shown the way. You have read Norman McLean. You have seen the movie. You have no excuse. <laughs> the existence of your moral compass is not in question. Nonetheless, we need a question. It's my duty here today, speaking in this position, to raise a question and a good one. Something that bounces around in the back of your head to help you frame and understand the celebration and thought and discussion and connection that will take place among us during the next couple of days here in the watershed of the Big Blackfoot River. So my question is this. You have this moral compass. What are you going to do with it? Thank you.
Wow. <laughs> uh, phenomenal. I don't know about you, that touched me. Although I do have a, I would dispute because we love that river and it's a river, but it's also a fucking metaphor. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, it means a lot to all of us and uh, not just because it's pretty water, but it represents so much more. And Norman's writing uh, brings that out so much but no more than what John just spoke about. That was truly remarkable. <clears throat> so I get my breath back. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Stephanie Ambrose Tubbs. Uh, you may recognize the name. Her father wrote the definitive Lewis and Clark uh, story, uh, the, the easiest to read and the most informative of all the books about that. Uh, but Stephanie has uh, created her own career and established her own uh, cred. Uh, well, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got my notes in inverse order. Stephanie, relax. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding about that. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is, uh, is not Stephanie Ambrose Tubbs. <laughs> uh, Deborah Magpie Erling. She's a Native American novelist, uh, short story writer, uh, wrote the book Perma Red, which is soon to become a movie. Uh, uh, I am all ears to hear her speak. I don't know the subject of her talk, and so I really can't give much more preliminary lead in, but I don't think we need it. I will just open the, the mic and please greet Deborah Magpie early. Thank Minor you. mistake. <laughs> Oops. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words, and some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by waters. I love that line, um, from the basement of time. I was thinking about what Richard had said about, about time. A um, hundred years ago is just really a blink of an eye. Sixty years ago, um, I was born in 1957. Uh, stories, sailor stories pass are the living breath from, from one generation to the next. So I think of 60 years ago in 1957, and then I think of a hundred years ago in 1857, uh, two years, two years. You, you probably know someone who's 100 years old. <laughs> two years um, just to, after uh, the, the signing of the 1855 Hellgate Treaty. Time is, is an is interesting idea and phenomenon, but it, it is always uh, all of the events that have occurred are present with us. And I think about this, this raging fire that's around us. It's interesting because the old stories uh, tell of uh, a time when Missoula, well, there will never be a time when Missoula doesn't have a stench to it. And wherever that comes from, what used to be the, the mills, uh, I have, ter I have heard old stories that the, the, the stench comes from uh, Hellgate Canyon. And will always, uh, there will always be a smell in this valley because of the things that happened at Hellgate Canyon. Um, and, you know, I wanted to tell a happy story today. <laughs> really, I wanted to tell a story that was uplifting because 
Uh, the stories were told in the deepest part of winter, usually the storytelling, uh, the, the storytelling months uh, that helped the people to survive. And the stories were to uplift people's spirits. So coyote stories were told in the deepest part of winter. Um, you, don't, you do not tell a coyote story um, in the summer. And I recently was at a, at a conference where they were telling coyote stories. Um, Non-Indians were telling coyote stories. And I thought, wow, you should probably lift your ankles up because the rattlesnakes guard uh, the stories. So you're not supposed to tell them. Uh, today, though, I thought instead of telling a story, and I really wanted to tell it just a, such a happy story, but the stories that I've been told about the Blackfoot region and Hell's Gate Canyon, uh, which is, uh, you know, one of our, the stories that we, that I've been told again and again. And so it's become so ingrained in my memory that um, I wrote about it from uh, the, the position of a warrior traveling through the canyon uh, when Father Desmet uh, was traveling. I haven't read this in years, and I've cut it significantly, and I want, I'll move on really quickly because I know um, there's poets who want to read, and so I'll just begin. Imagine one day a great and powerful people give your enemy the capacity to kill you in seconds. Give your enemy the capacity to enter your body with blunt lead no bigger than the tips of a small woman's fing fingers. So many weapons, so many stinging rifles, so many sizzling bullets, you yourself become gun-wise and squinting. The only medicine power you hold is a, the ability to see those bullets before they singe you. That is all. And nothing you have ever possessed, no medicine bundle, no prayers of your chief can save you. Imagine all the great men of your tribe are dying in their efforts to feed you, to bring back the buffalo through the belly of the canyon. These men, your men, your warriors are dying, not to battle, but to daily slaughter because you are hungry, because your people are hungry. Would you in your stupidity and hunger mistake your old enemy, the Blackfeet, for the true evil, while the white man sits back in buffalo armchairs smoking cigarettes somebody else has rolled for him. The white man was busy, was wise to kill us by giving their guns to our enemies. Indians kill Indians. We were all too busy killing ourselves to stop the white man. All of our warriors began dying in the narrow canyon. So many deaths, the French fur trappers called this place the gates of hell. Hell's gate. The Blackfeet shot the flatheads and even the crows with guns so powerful the warriors came to know the bones of their head scattered like fast, walk of ro like fast water over rocks. They could see the gunfire sky through the open chests of their brothers. They could see the fingers of their own hands spilling to hard ground like stick games. No medicine man could save them from the cracking blue clouds that hovered over the canyon. Their blood lit the sky. They would die hearing the odd snap of their own bones falling too fast to brace themselves. If they did not lose their vision in the blue flash of gunpowder, they could look up to see Blackfeet flanking the top of the narrow canyon, Blackfeet warriors' shadows striping down the steep rocks toward them. Now, when I look up, I see the enemy past the smell of sulfur, past the red taps of fire, the blue or bitten, rain-bitten sky. I have seen our warriors with holes as big as their heads blooming in their chests, but still they kept on walking. They kept on walking for a while, dead, but continuing the walk because they were going home. Because going home to them meant the survival of their people, but they never made it home. They dropped here one after the other. Their bodies lined the canyon two, three feet deep. I can't tell you what it is like to see all this death because it is something beyond death. It is a story too big for one person to tell. They have died here without burial. They will always haunt this place. If this is Hell's Gate like the French say, then the gate has closed on them at night. You can hear their hard puffing breath if you stand back from the canyon. 
We turned to the white men for help and found our power. We'd seen the glinting crosses on the black robe's chest. We gave ourselves to the promise of redemption. We learned the first lesson of many. To get power, one must give power. We were asked to accompany the black robes back into the wound of the canyon. The black robes offered to take us, to lead us through hell's gate. There is a group of us. I cannot see the faces of the Indian men I'm riding with, but I know their names, their old names. The black robes have changed our names. As we enter the mouth of the canyon, I say their names, their old names, starves out, steals deer, small salmon, sharp knife, red robe, morning water, blue deer, calls big elk, magpie cap, three dresses, too soon dark. I say names I remember over and over. I look at the twitching mane of my horse, trying not to look up or down. We are silent. We are heading up the canyon. I see little scalp lift his head back. I see the muscles in his brown back tighten. I see little scalp again, arching his throat up. His neck is tight and thick. I know he is turning away from what he is seeing. This big man, our good warrior, I do not want to be here. The ears of the horses flatten back. He comes to me like a rain of sparrows. The canyon swells with the bad smell. Fat-bellied birds fly up from the dark walls of the place we are entering. The black robes lead us and we follow with our heads bowed. We don't want to follow them into the canyon because we can hear the whispering there. This is the place where the black feet gain their new power. We know even with the black robes, all the bad that has been done here cannot be undone. The land now holds the stories of all these dead men and all the people who mourn them. I can see the hands of the flathead men in front of me. Their hands are smooth and beautiful and dark, shielding their faces. A rush of birds hiss above us. We watch the birds looking up. We keep looking up because we can hear the hooves of horses striking the ground made sleek with the flesh of a thousand dead warriors, our warriors, our family. Around the turn of a rock rise, a smell is growing like heat. The smell is meeting us. I see the black robes covering their mouths. I see little scalp put his head down. Death and the stench of ourselves is what we smell. The worst part of us all, a lack of memory. We had forgotten ourselves. We had made ourselves the enemy. One white man in a black robe gets off his horse and stands in the pitch of a hundred dead Indians. Old blood rises up to meet the first buttons of his shoes. The smell slaps the backs of our heads. The flies are hard and black and thick. They hum around the head of the black robe who has gotten off of his horse. Eli too soon dark grins and I can see his hard yellow teeth. Then I see the broken teeth of the dead scattered on the ground. The priest sprinkles water. He paces the width of the canyon piddling a small jar of holy water in the ground. We watch him because the sound makes us laugh without wanting to. Because the sound of holy water makes the sound of an old man pissing, and there is a shame in us. There is nothing sacred here. Somehow our people had died without honor in this bad place. We had turned on ourselves. No prayers will save us. The wind stings, our eyes water. I see a man's dead face sinking to the peck of crows. I can hear the scatter of my heart the snorting nostrils of the horses in this heat, this stench of white man gunfire. I see the white days of sky stunned by short rain, stunned by a hunter's moon, stunned by our return. Hell's Gate, they call this place. Hell's Gate. So I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Those were two of the most powerful readings I've heard in years. I, I, I wow, again, excellent. Uh, we're privileged, a small group privileged to have been able to be present for that. Uh, we have a group of youths here uh, from Sealy Lake. Uh, and uh, they're going to be reading from uh, their, their work of literature uh, called The Backroads of the Mind. Uh, these are poems, and uh, we're, we're privileged to have them speak here. If you've listened to the last two things, you realize you have a high bar here, <laughs> but I know you can do it. It's all yours. Hello, I have the distinct privilege and honor of being these young people's English teacher at Sealy Swan High School. I was thinking that in the footsteps of Norman McLean, I'm one of these crazy people who drive back and forth between Missoula and Sealy Lake an awful lot. Um, and I do it for this reason, because it's such a privilege to get to work with these young people in a community where in the recent election, parents voted equally passionately for both candidates, and many of them passionately, after thinking and thinking, couldn't bring themselves to vote for either, um, feeling disillusioned by the system. And yet, their children come to school at Sealy Swan High School and speak civilly to each other and um, work things out fabulously well, and it's incredibly hopeful um, for me to get to be a part of. So uh, I'll tell you just briefly about what you're going to be hearing from. So this is Backroads of the Mind. This is the second ever literary magazine produced by Sealy Swan High School. It's um, completely crafted by our students in the creative writing class and submissions of art and writing come from all the students in the school. We will have them for sale afterwards. Um, if anybody is interested in purchasing one, you can just uh, come find us. So we have four pieces that we're gonna read for you, all that are in Backroads. Elizabeth Doan, our editor, is going to first read a piece that she didn't write herself and then they will each write a piece that they did write themselves the first piece is by Abram Pocha, um, young man attending University in Helena this year, graduated last spring. When he came to me as a freshman, his first paper was late by a couple weeks, and I finally called his mom, and she was not surprised by my call. And, um, but what she said to me is, oh, please, 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 don't let this turn into what writing has been like for him the last eight years of his elementary school life when he hated it more year after year after year. We cannot stand another year like this. And um, it brought me to tears his senior year when he wrote this piece that you're gonna hear and then said, you know, I never thought I could um, say that I liked writing again and he had come to that place and you'll hear it in this piece. River Junction. Ripples and mist, byproducts of the North Fork merging with the little Blackfoot. Cool waters mixing with the soft summer air, a whipping fly rod in my right hand, cream yellow fly line in my left. This sacred merging is important to me, not because the fishing is great here, but because the realization of life has happened here. Embraced memories on the sparkling sand shore, fleeting foresights of what is to come. My greatest fear has always been that one day this valley will be gone, replaced by roaring highways, a million people, and a lust for what it used to be, a metropolis of livestock and wildlife, a land full of lessons that can only be learned in the Rocky Mountain countryside, how to love unconditionally, how to work hard and smart, how to be patient with city folk, and most importantly, how to live a life of regrets of what you did or didn't do. When I was young, my father would take me fishing 
on streams that run down the Rocky Mountains out of the Bob Marsha wilderness. It wasn't until I was 11 that I found that real fishing is fly fishing, an art performed on one of Earth's most simple elegances, the Blackfoot River. Now you may have heard of the Blackfoot in Norman MacLean's book, A River Runs Through It, or maybe even been to it yourself, but it isn't just a river to me. It is a signal of relief, a place of rest, and a pleasant reminder that even though life's hard time, that, that even through life's hard times, you can always go fishing. It can heal the deepest sorrows and cool the worst burns from riverside campfires. Nothing could ever replace the Blackfoot River in my mind. It's home, a never-ending love story that uses its soft, lulling tones of flowing water to heal a broken heart and not cause a new one. It doesn't give you any answer by speaking or leading or even holding you inside of an eddy or swirling water, but answers you by not doing anything. All it does is listen until you solve it yourself. It lets you use your own wisdom through its soothing sounds of merging waters. The soft lullaby to all the freshmen, young and old. I mean, fishermen, young and old. <laughs> Whoops. I am River Junction, that confluence of the North Fork and the Blackfoot. At 18, the prelude of my life is nearing the end and entering the next chapter of college and city life, just like the cold waters of the North Fork mix into the Blackfoot. My life before college will linger with me into the rest of my life, influencing my decisions, my views on things, most of all, how I deal with problems. I distinctly remember a time when I was young and thought the world was only as big as the Blackfoot. There wasn't a place that I went where it wasn't there. Just a short car ride away providing relief, rest, and of course, trout. Nothing can compare to my home in the Blackfoot Valley. It's where I grew up, where I'm happy, and where all the problems of the world melt into smooth waters. Uh, hi, I'm Nicole Williams. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, uh, this is my poem, Baby Girl. Is it? <laughs> okay. You never learned how to manage yourself. Mama never taught you that. You were born screaming, and you've been screaming ever since. Hot under the collar, baby girl, and you don't have a lick of sense. You've been biting back every curse and choking on your age. You're damaged goods, darling. You were born a mistake. Who hurt you, baby girl? Who the hell made you this way? Bite your cheek until it bleeds and swallow up the blood. You were born with a coal inside your stomach, baby girl. You can't put out the flame. At some point, you had to break, started spitting out the flames, burned everyone you loved, baby girl, only had, only had yourself to blame. You can't spit out the coal. You can't take away the hurt. God made you in his image. Baby girl, you're cursed. Hi, I'm Kyle Pelkey, and this is my poem. I'll let you adjust it. Thank you. Um, and this is my poem, Bathtub Still Life Featuring Swedish Fish. <laughs> when you're sleeping in a hotel bathtub, you're at your all-time low. Why are you sleeping in a hotel bathtub when there are two nice warm beds in the main room next to you? How can a bathtub be comfortable or fitting? First, become small, small like you are nothing. Lean against the wall opposite the faucet, place a leg on either side, and try to relax, as if on a sunny beach. Now, why are you sleeping in a bathtub? Because you're trying to keep the feelings of love and remembrance from running down the drain. You try to keep them contained in the bathtub. There's always that one scene in the middle of a movie that shows the main character sleeping or sitting in the bathtub, all alone, just thinking, thinking, thinking. Not even this, the distant train noises can drive out the sounds of him leaving, slamming the door, tears drying on your cheeks as you choke on a broken heart. The only thing you can do is stare into the moldy tile walls that surround you, three corners and all, like an old gas station sink and unscrubbed toilets, black with bacteria, swimming like your thoughts. Bathtubs are great. Bathtubs will become your new best friend. Bathtubs will always be there for you. If you need to bathe, just strip your tear-dampened Pikachu shirt or whatever. 
You can write poetry at 4 a.m. while not bothering anyone. You can watch Netflix for hours upon hours while devouring three tons of Swedish fish, almost until red turns to green. You can watch The Notebook and eat a tub of rainbow sherbet and cry, and even after all these things, people will judge you for sleeping in a bathtub. <laughs> sleeping in a bathtub is not a walk in the park. It is tricky to fit two people in a cold porcelain shell comfortably. It becomes a third world government when there is no ice cream, Netflix, or red number 40 colored fish. When you can hear outside the window the sounds of people talking on their phones about the love they never truly had, stray dogs barking, remind you about a slip on your door saying you need to get out because you can't afford rent. When you feel lost at 2 a.m. when listening to heartfelt alternative rock songs, you chew on ideas as if they were Swedish fish. When all the real world problems hit along with your own stubborn regret, the only thing you can do is curl up in a bathtub, not pay rent, and chew on ideas as, as if they were Swedish fish. Writing poetry is like sleeping in a bathtub. I'm back. <laughs> okay, this piece is called Riverkin. The young woman standing on my banks, long walnut hair, soles of her feet darkened with mineral dense dirt, azure eyes that mirror myself. I've seen many strange things, a cow elk that has twins every spring, piebald white tails that drink from me. This is not my doing, nor my will. Never would I have carved such a duplicate. I know what bloodline she's from. I cannot say what generation. Creeks carry their heritage through her limbs. I wonder why she doesn't know her ancestor's name. Her ancestor went by Jerry. Emotions ran leagues deep. Thoughts were crisscrossing currents. Jerry had more wisdom than she had years. Oh, the older one was a river all her own with secrets. Like Jerry, I hear her whispering thoughts through my thundering voice. Does she know how alike she is? Temper crashing like morel falls. Aspen bark skin that turns the color of kinnikinnick in July sunlight. Do I even have answers for her? This one, the young one, she too has seen more than her years, but she has memories to prove it. She is a river, all her own questions rushing behind her eyes. Not in the longest of icy slumbers would I have imagined either on my banks. What a shame they never met. Never could I have carved such a replica. I'm Gene Shade. Uh, we're going to take a short break now, but I'd like to announce that uh, the chapel through the front steps has been opened up for today only. So if anyone would like to uh, view the chapel, uh, Reverend uh, McLean's uh, um, church, uh, please feel free to do so. So we're going to take a short 15 minute break. 10 minute break. 10 minute break. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 